Good morning. I'll announce myself on stage. That's the benefit. Being up here, you can just stay up here, right? Good to see so many faces, some new. I'm excited and honored my parents could make it. They're back there. They could just raise their hand. Yes, that my parents and family. You can pull this down a little bit. Let's pray before we start. Father, we just want to hear your words this morning, not mine. Just speak through me, Father. Just help us to take to heart what you want us to learn this morning, to hear it through, um, through the words of the Spirit, Father, not through natural ears. In your name, amen. All right, I like lots of stories because they're real life. And then you can identify it, you can remember with it. So I have plenty of stories today. I, I heard a story recently, or read one, on my little um, husband tips that I get every day. Um, it was about the, this story. There was, a, there was a huge split in one of the churches in the U.S. And um, they actually took each other to court, both sides of the church. It went so far. And um, yeah, still yet. They were so upset and so offended and worked up that both sides took each other to court. The court didn't know what to do with them and sent them back to their denomination and said, you guys figured out, you guys decided wrong what happened. And when they tracked back the problem to where it started, you know what they found out? It started at a church supper when one of the elders received a piece of ham on a plate and a little boy right beside him got a bigger piece of ham. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? That's where it started. The church elder got a smaller piece of ham than this little boy beside him, and, and something stirred up. Something happened. He got offended. Everybody say offended. 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 So that's what we're talking about today. You know, it's something that happens to all of us, right? At times. The dictionary says... Offense, something that causes a person to be hurt, angry, or upset. I want you to say this after me. Offense creates offense. Okay, like what does that mean? I'm going to ask Jeannie to put up a, a picture so you get the idea. Offense creates offense. Get it? Okay. Thank you, Jeannie. Offense creates offense. Literally, it creates offense around our hearts, around our spirits. When we get offended and we don't deal with it, we can produce a lot of fruit, such as hurt, anger, outrage, jealousy, resentment, strife, bitterness, hatred, and envy. You know, and these fruits can lead on to more things. It doesn't stop there. They can lead to insults, attacks, wounding, division, separation, broken relationships, and betrayal. That sounds really bad, right? Like, not me. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't be like that. But just like the little piece of ham story, it starts so small. Something creeps in and a root gets there. You know, like just, just for example, we have lots of people that are passionate about lots of different things. Uh, we have so many mixed cultures here, Mennonite background, American, and all that, so there's it a lot of chance to misunderstand, right? There's a lot of chance to get offended. Man against woman, husband and wife, young and old, we just don't always understand each other. But let's say, for example, that I say that Ford trucks are the best, right? And anybody who drives a Chevy or something else is not thinking properly. Don't say anything. Don't start. <laughs> no, just an example. I don't have an opinion yet. Okay, now the Chevy lover's hair might kind of stand up a little bit, and a friendly argument can start, and there's a small rift starts to happen because, you know, the Chevy and Ford lovers are arguing in a friendly way. And then the next time I get up here to lead worship, 
the Chevy lover back there, he's kind of having a hard time even looking at me and watching me because I just declared this thing that I had no business doing and I offended him. His heart, you know, he put up a fence as soon as I said that and didn't deal with it. Just like that little picture, a fence went up, the lock went on and he didn't deal with it. It can grow, it can grow. The problem with a fence is it doesn't just affect your relationship one to each other. It goes beyond that. It literally interferes with our relationship with God. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew 5, 22. I think she'll have it up there as well. Matthew 5, 22 to 24. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother, angry ties in with offense, will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, which means empty head, is answerable to the church authority. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, or coming to church and getting ready to worship, similar idea, and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. You see, it tells us directly, don't come with garbage in the way, with offense in the way. Um, as, as another story I read, this man served under one of the greatest pastors in the U.S. at a time. And when he first joined that church and started serving in his ministry, he used to just sit in awe and, and just, you know, almost open-mouthed when this preacher spoke. He was anointed, he was gifted, and this, and this man under him just soaked it up. But he was close to him, and over time he started to see little flaws. He started to see little things where he began to question the pastor's judgment he began to get critical and judgmental and that developed into offense. He didn't deal with it. And suddenly, when he would listen to that pastor the next Sunday or beyond there, he didn't sense that same anointing. He didn't receive that same, that same thing he did before. What happened? Did the pastor lose his anointing or was it the man under him where he put up a fence? So he had a chance to actually leave that church and start another ministry with another couple that was doing something else. And they said, yeah, you're not happy there. You're, it's not working out there. This other pastor has flaws and mistakes and, you know, we'll take you with us. You're anointed. Come serve with us. So he did. He actually left for a little while just because, you know, he felt justified. It seemed the right thing to do. And there was still no peace. There was no anointing in the new setting, in the new church, where he was free of that other pastor. So what happened? There was still something around his heart. There was still a root there. And God spoke to him and said, you need to go back. I never released you to leave that church. You left with a fence. You need to go back, fix that, and then I will guide you and lead you in the way you should go. He went back and stayed there for years. He got back on a one-on-one -on -one relationship with that pastor. And as soon as he restored that, he apologized. That anointing was back. The anointing that he heard, the pastor's anointing never changed, is what the man under him received. Okay, so there's, there's different kinds of offense, right? There's times when there's just a, a ham situation or a Chevy and a Ford situation. Those are kind of minor, right? But what about when somebody truly offends you? You know, you just, you just feel like they stabbed you in the back. Don't we have a right to be offended? What about Joseph? Do you think he had a right to be offended? That's a tough story if you look at it, you know, in this light. As I was reading through it slowly, again, just kind of digesting it, I could not have done what he did in that attitude First, he had these dreams, you know, these God-given dreams. And um, he's like, wow, there's a lot in store for me. There's so much good coming. 
and then the first blow. You know, he's betrayed by his own brothers, his own family. That's pretty deep. That hurts. They sell him, almost kill him. And, uh, you know, he goes through this really hard time. It looks like his dreams are crushed. And then he gets like a little raise, a little promotion. It's like, wow, I can see a light again. And he doesn't get offended. And then that dream is crushed again. He's thrown into jail, right? Potiphar's wife, you know, gets him in trouble. He didn't do anything wrong. He's just being a good steward. He goes straight to jail. His dream is, is just flattened. It's crushed. Worse than before. They're not like modern jails. And, um, you know, it just, if it were me, I would, I would be having a hard time with God at this point. I would be saying, God, you know, I have these dreams. I have these things that you have given me. I've done the right thing all the time. And this, these huge problems, these things keep coming my way. What's going on? It would be so easy to get offended at God, right? But he didn't. He kept trusting. He kept believing. You know, and it just goes on and on and on. And finally, God, through all the shaking, through all the trials, through all the offense that he overcomes, he does not let it stay in his heart. He moves on. He goes past it. Then God says, you are ready. He exalts him to that place of honor. He saves thousands, if not millions of lives. And his dream is there. You know why? He stayed free from offense. Say, no one. Everybody say it together. No one, no one. except yourself, except yourself. Can, stop can stop the purposes of God for your life. You know that? Nobody, no demon, no other person can stop the purposes of God for your life. Except yourself. God's given us a choice, free will. Same thing with David. Remember David in the Bible? David and Saul. He's anointed as the future king, right? Like, wow, what a promise. What a, what a gift. And um, soon after that, he goes and kills Goliath. He gets Saul's daughter. He's, he's son-in-law to the king. He is the king's son, basically. That means no taxes, beautiful wife, you're famous. And it's just like, wow, this, this dream is just blossoming. It's awesome. And, and Saul is troubled sometimes. Who does he call to sing and, and play anointed music? He calls David right there in the palace with him. It's like, man, this is, this is just getting better and better all the time. And then after, after battle one time, you know, the people all start singing. Saul is slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And what happens? It just goes downhill from there. Offense sets in. Saul tries to kill David. He gets offended at him. And then David's dreams get flattened. They get crushed at that point. You know, again, if it were me or if it were you, well, how would you react if God has given you all these dreams and these things? It looks like it's coming to pass. And then somebody just wipes it out right in front of you. Wouldn't you feel kind of hurt? Right? Can somebody say amen? Or is it just me? Wouldn't we feel kind of crushed? I'm sure David had a hard time in his heart, but he did not let offense set in. So much so that he declared Saul to be God's anointed at that time, at that place. You know, it would be hard for me personally to say that a lot of the leaders in place in our country, in other countries, are God's anointed, but they are. Whether we see it or believe it or not, they are. And David kept his heart free from offense. He had two chances to kill him, and he had all rights, right? It's self-defense, kind of the law of the West. Someone tries to kill you, you have a right to kill them. Simple. He didn't. He said, God, this is, your, this is your problem. This is your deal. He waited for God and trusted him to work it out. Again, no man or devil can change or override the will of God for your life. Can you say if? If you stay free 
from offense and humble. There's a verse, Second Samuel 1, verse 14, 15, just a part of it. You know, when, when another man finally killed Saul and judgment was carried out, David's heart was so free from offense, he still grieved for him. And he said, how is it that you were not afraid to put out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And he had that man killed right there on the spot. He grieved for Saul still like a father. Wow, what an example. In Romans 12, verse 19, it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. Bitterness. You know what bitterness is? I was, I was kind of surprised to hear this definition. Bitterness is simply revenge that is not carried out. Makes sense, right? It is revenge that is not carried out. You know, if, if Denver here gives me a good punch and I get to punch him right back, well, oh, then I feel good. He got it back. We're all free. We're all happy. But if I don't get to, there starts to get to be a bitterness and I start to, that bitterness grows into offense. It's revenge. It's not carried out. You know, how many of you, how many of us would humbly stay and serve in a church where we saw some pretty serious problems? Probably not many, right? We would find a couple dozen verses and, and reasons and things why we should leave and why there's so many things wrong, right? What about in a church where you'd see that the pastor was lazy and completely insensitive to the Holy Spirit? where his children, his sons, would be uh, literally fornicating with the women of the church or those who came in back areas around the church. That would be disgusting to us. We would be angered. We'd be outraged. We'd be offended. We'd probably start, you know, calling down fire and brimstone or something and rebuking him and warning everybody, don't go there. It's so messed up. There's so many problems. Let me save you. Don't go there. We try to expose them maybe so that they don't cause any damage and hurt anybody else. You know, as good, righteous people, right? But that's not our job. You know, this lines up exactly with the story in the Bible. Samuel. Young Samuel in the temple. This is exactly what was happening. Eli was um, completely self-focused, self-indulgent. His sons were very corrupt and um, just doing all kinds of outrageous stuff but Samuel as a boy honored God he honored Eli still he didn't seek for a way to go talk to the other priests and get a delegation together and have Eli thrown out because of his wickedness and his son's wickedness he left it to God he kept looking at God not Eli and in time God took care of it and as such, Samuel's ministry was great. He was a powerful man of God because he stayed free from offense. You know, knowing God's will for your life will help you stand firm in times of shaking and when somebody offends you, even when it's somebody close to you. For example, if I'm offended by Jolene, my wife, you know, I still know that she's the one for me. I still know that she loves me. I still know that God brought her into my life. And nothing's going to change that. So that little moment of offense, I can override it by looking past, looking beyond. That's what Joseph did. That's what David did. They looked past the moment. They looked beyond to the promise. That's how offense did not stay rooted there. You know, if God wants you at a certain job or a certain church or married to a certain person, then that revelation, when he reveals that to you by the Holy Spirit, that is your rock of truth that you can stand on. If you know he wants you in Belize, then the hardship and the trouble that you go through and the paperwork 
and the stuff that just grinds at your nerves sometimes. That is your rock of truth that God wants me here. If you don't know that, if you don't know his truth for your life, you're going to be shaken, you're going to fall down, you're going to scatter and leave with offense. When Jesus spoke to his followers and offended many of them by saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood, many left him. John 6, verse 60, Jesus said, does this offend you? And do you also want to leave? He didn't negotiate. He didn't soften his words or say, no, I, I really meant this, not that. He simply said, does this offend you? He didn't try to change anything. He wanted their hearts to be right. But then Peter, he is the bold one. He already had the revelation that Jesus was the Christ. Remember a while back he had said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so on that revelation, on that truth, even after Jesus said these, these words that were hard for them to hear, he replied, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, even though they didn't understand what it meant at the moment. In the hardships and the heartbreaks of life, it's so easy to get offended at God. You know, there's, a, there's another story about um, a story I read of this boy. He was about, started at 14 years old. <coughs> Excuse me. And he was raised in the church. He was passionate for God. And this, this boy was just strong in the faith. It is, it is a lot of older people looked up to him as a young guy because he was so passionate, so on fire. And he would go on mission trips and he would witness to everybody he could. He was just so on fire. And when he got to 18, um, his father died of cancer. They prayed, they believed, and his father still died. And he was, he took it hard, but he was okay. He was still strong. It's like God's will. It's okay. And as he called his friends to tell them that his father had just died, it was over, they were already crying on the other side of the line. And um, he didn't know if they had heard already. And he found out they were crying because one of his best friends had just died at that same time as well in a car crash. And then two months later, you know, he's struggling through all these feelings, all these things, what to do. Two months later, he's, he's driving back home and he comes upon this crash scene Two cars hit each other, and he finds out both the cars are full of people and friends he knew, or he knows. And it was a really bad crash. Two of them died that day, you know, one as he was just holding them. So in a matter of less than two months, four people all around him, they died. And he didn't know why. He, didn't, he couldn't explain it. So his heart became so offended I, I don't blame him, honestly. Four people, your, your father, your friends, all around you dying. What do you do with that? And so he basically said, God, if this, is, if this is how you treat me after I've served you, after I've loved you, I've been so passionate for you, I don't want anything to do with you. And people literally say this all the time. I just met a guy at the lumber yard, you know, a few weeks back, and he's, he said, oh, he used to believe in God, but then there was a murder happened in his family. He's been through war, and it's just terrible. This, there can't be a God if there's stuff like this. His heart was filled with offense and bitterness. He couldn't get over it. He couldn't look beyond. But the story ends well for this boy. He, he goes through like half a year's time of struggling, of pain, and, and, you know, he basically just throws God aside. But his, his heart is just pulled back to God because he knows God is there. He knows he's real. And his relationship is restored back with God over time, stronger, deeper than it ever was. 
He's now not only passionate, on fire for God, he's shaken, he's tried, he's humble, he doesn't walk in his own confidence. You know, we can never serve the Lord for what he can do for us, but what, for what he has already done and for who he is. You know, we think that God owes us something if we serve him the right way, do the right things, right? It's kind of natural. God, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to be a good boy and, you know, you make my life good, make it easy. And we'll just keep going like that. It's a good deal. That's not the way it works. No matter how our lives are, no matter how this broken, messed up world is, God has already paid the price. And he promises to be there for us. But there's still hard times. He's already paid the, the ultimate price, saving us from death and hell. So just like Peter, he had to have his confidence completely shaken, right? Right? When he betrayed Jesus, his confidence was shaken, but then later was restored before he could be the man that God needed him to be. You know, like I said, we all get offended at times, either by accident or somebody does on purpose. So to say, don't get offended, is kind of like telling you, get on a scooter and drive through a rainstorm and stay dry. Right? If you zigzag enough and drive fast enough, you'll stay dry. No, you're going to get offended. We need to exercise our hearts to stay free of that. We need to work through it, deal with it, and stay free, get free. The key to getting free from your offenses is to not hold on to them. Don't get bitter. Offense really does create offense around our heart and life. When you hold on to offense, it's a complete inward focus. It destroys your relationship and cuts you off from God. In Matthew 6, verse 15, it says, But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. Last story here. I read about this recently on Facebook. It is is a modern story. This this woman had an only son, and he's about 17. He's probably in a place where he shouldn't be, but he got into a fight and he was murdered. So this woman has no husband, no other child. Her only son is murdered. So the the murderer gets caught and goes to jail, gets a long sentence. But this woman knows that her anger, her, her hatred towards him is just eating her alive. It's like a cancer. So she starts, um, she starts praying for him. She finally gets up the courage to go visit him and starts witnessing to this murderer of her only son. And over time, she, she asked the warden of the prison, you know, this guy's being good. Can you please shorten his sentence or put him out on parole I will keep an eye on him I want him to live right beside me in an apartment right beside mine and over time that's what he did he granted her request and this murderer and and the lady the mother of the son they live side by side and this man you know he was he was so blown away by her forgiveness he almost couldn't forgive himself for that and yet she forgave him she loved him and it just grew and grew in a positive way instead of opposite so now because of her actions because of her forgiveness and love to this man he's become like a son to her and he has started his own ministry witnessing to other people talking to them talking to other prisoners and his life is just transformed they're both set free. They're both able to speak and inspire. So you see, if you take that, that pill of bitterness that sometimes life gives us, and you give it to God, and you let him deal with it in his way, God can take it and make it the most beautiful thing in your life. Let's all stand up.
I'd like us just to read the last verse all together. If Jeannie can put it up. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5. Yeah, once you put it up there, let's just read it all together. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. There you go. Let's read it together. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have the divine power to diminish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take it captive, every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Amen. Take every thought, everything, every word, bring it into subjection to Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we just ask that you will deal with our hearts, that you will search us, and by your Holy Spirit, just put your finger right there on our heart. If there's something there that we need to deal with, Father, we choose to get rid of it. We choose to deal with it in the name of Jesus. Father, we don't want to hold on to offenses and bitterness. Lord, we want to be effective for you. We want your kingdom to grow. Father, we want to do your will and take every thought captive. Father, we just thank you for your love. Thank you that you're so gentle. No matter what we do, you're just right there to guide us and bring us back to your truth. I just pray that your Holy Spirit will be around each and every one as we go home and go our way, that we will remember to stay free from offense, Jesus. It's not your way. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for listening. I just pray that you take these words to heart. Amen.